Good afternoon. This is Kim McCleary. I'm president and CEO of the CFIDS Association of America. And because we have an audience of people with a number of different uh, conditions, I'll just spell that out. That's Chronic Fatigue and Immune Dysfunction Syndrome Association of America. And it's um, my pl pleasure and privilege to welcome everybody here today for this webinar that is part of the association's 2010 webinar series um, being hosted today in um, collaboration with the Overlapping Conditions Alliance. And uh, we're delighted that so many people have registered. As of uh, about 10 minutes ago, there were 471 registrants for today's program, which is just fantastic. And the numbers for uh, those in attendance are climbing as we speak. So before um, we get underway with our program, if I can get my slides to advance, I had this problem yesterday, apologies. No, not again. Um, well, I have some sort of overall opening comments and I can't get my slides to move forward. I am, it's a problem. If everybody will bear with me one second, I'm going to switch the screen back so everybody's got the uh, waiting room and try to address my slides here for a second. Sorry about that. I think I've got it working now. Can everybody see the, well, the only ones I can hear actually are um, my fellow speakers. Does that screen say welcome now? Yes. Great, thanks. Okay, so this is the sixth webinar of our series. Um, and just sort of a few points because I know from our registration uh, questions that about half of the folks who are on the line today, um, this is their first webinar. So just a little bit of orientation to let you know that there are uh, four speakers for today's program, but we are all in different locations. So we can't see you and we can't see one another. So we're a little bit handicapped here without having the body language of a live audience in front of us to um, take cues from. And we can't see one another, so we can't kick each other under the table or give hand signals or uh, the cut sign or any of those things. So um, I hope you'll just bear with us. Um, as I said, we had 471 registrants uh, as of a little bit ago, and that number was going up rapidly this afternoon, so I imagine we'll probably cap 500. Um, in the registration process, there was the opportunity to submit questions in advance, and uh, I shared those with uh, my fellow speakers earlier today, although, uh, as I mentioned, the registration numbers went up in the last couple of hours, so we haven't had the full benefit of a lot of time to go through some of the more recent questions, but we'll do our best to try to cover the material um, that registrants told us they were looking for. And although we have a pretty packed uh, program this afternoon, um, we hope to have some time for a brief Q&A at the end of the presentations. And please go ahead and type your questions into the little dialog box that you have on the dashboard on the right side of your screen um, as you think of those questions. And the way that this uh, webinar software works, it's not possible to direct a particular question to a particular speaker. So that's sort of my job as I multitask um, here. And I'll, I'll do my best to uh, get that to the right person. And then we'll just have a round robin at the end of each of our uh, slide presentations. And just as a reminder, I know that many people come to these webinars and hope to get some personal uh, advice and, and recommendations, but none of the four of us is an MD, and this format doesn't really lend itself to um, questions of a, of a more personal, particular nature, even when we do have an MD as speaker. So just to remind everybody that we're not able to give any treatment advice or make diagnoses or any of those things. We're not really doctors. We just play one on TV sort of thing as, as we do this today. 
I'm going to have another problem with my slide again. Okay, I'm having to do this a little bit of a backwards way to advance my slides. I apologize. Um, hopefully everybody can see that now. Um, our four speakers today, um, again, for those who've just joined, my name is Kim McCleary. I'm the one on the bottom right, and I'm President and CEO of the CFITS Association of America. Also uh, joining me on this kind of panel this afternoon is Mary Lou Balweg from the Endometriosis Association. She is President and Executive Director of that organization, and we'll be speaking about endometriosis. We also have Terry Cowley, who is the president of the TMJ Association, and Chris Veasley, who's the associate director of the National Vulvodynia Association. And so uh, I think for all but me, this is their first time speaking on a webinar. So uh, we had a little practice session yesterday, and hopefully we'll all manage uh, the technical end of our responsibilities um, to make this program um, interesting and, and uh, fruitful for everybody who's participated. Okay, I apologize again, my slides are not cooperating. But um, just as sort of an overview, the title for this program of, of being overlapping conditions uh, raised a lot of questions that we got through the registration process and other uh, online forums about what, what does that mean. And um, we know as leaders of organizations that deal with four of these conditions that oftentimes um, the diagnosis is made for one condition or another and either at the same time or later in the, uh, as the illness progresses or time moves on and uh, the aging process occurs, other conditions will come also to be diagnosed. And this is just really a partial list of the types of conditions that often coexist, overlap, or as uh, you'll find often in the literature, the word comorbid conditions, which just means they occur together. Um, and as I said, this list could be quite a bit longer, but these are some of the ones that have been studied and for which there is um, evidence of them co-occurring or at higher rates in people who have one of these conditions having more than one of these conditions at a time. And I think each of us is planning to cover um, some of the more common coexisting or overlapping conditions in each of our talks. And the ones in the pink here are the ones that we're going to talk about today. Um, but the ones over here on the bottom in the black and on the right in the black uh, could easily be incorporated into this list of common coexisting conditions. Our webinar agenda, just to give you a quick overview, is that I'm going to uh, have the pleasure of introducing a brand new campaign that the four of us have been working on together for um, what seems like years, but I guess has only been months, um, although our, our collaboration goes back before that. Uh, then Mary Lou Balweg will share with us some information about endometriosis. Terry will cover temporomandibular disorders. Uh, Chris will talk about vulvodynia, and then I'll finish up with uh, a description of CFS. And then, as I mentioned, we will hopefully have some time for um, Q&A. Um, the Campaign to End Chronic Pain in Women is a campaign that um, really is being announced for the first time this afternoon. So all of you participants are among the first to hear about this exciting collaborative endeavor that the four of us have been working on um, since September of last year, I believe, when we got together for the first time uh, with a, a larger group of uh, people who've been engaged in helping us shape and develop the materials for the campaign in October. And 
what this campaign is focused on is the evidence that up to 50 million American women suffer from these poorly understood and neglected chronic pain conditions, uh, some of which uh, were listed on the slide previously, um, and focusing on these six in particular. And that if you add up the total economic cost of those conditions, it approaches $80 billion every year to the annual health care bill. Of course, everybody has been hearing in the news, um, it's sort of hard to avoid it even if you want to, about health care reform and bending the cost curve and um, issues like that. Well, as anybody with any one of these conditions or more than one of these conditions knows, the inefficiency of our current health care system to diagnose, care for, and treat these conditions is hugely inefficient and terribly expensive and also leads to a lot of unnecessary suffering uh, because women are misdiagnosed, they're shuffled from office to office, they're inappropriately treated um, either with things that are inadequate or inappropriate or um, ineffective or they're not treated at all because they don't have access to care, um, but it leads to this chart um, of all the elements that contribute to, here at the bottom, the needless suffering of people because of the inefficiencies and ineffectiveness of the current health care model for conditions that don't have uh, clear diagnostic markers or um, recommended approved guidelines for therapy. So the Campaign to End Chronic Pain in Women is, as I mentioned, a collaborative event, a collaborative campaign. We are uh, very excited about a launch event that will take place on May 19th on Capitol Hill. We are having um, a briefing, a congressional briefing, with some of the members of the Congressional Caucus for Women's Issues. And right now we have four U.S. representatives scheduled to introduce the issues and uh, speak to the crowd that gathers there of uh, other legislators, staff people, media people, uh, hopefully some healthcare policy makers and individuals from other um, health and women's related organizations. And right now on the uh, speaker stocket are Lewis, Lois Capps from California, Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin, Jan Schakowsky from Illinois, and Nita Lowy from New York. Um, plus the four of us who are providing this webinar today will briefly talk about some of the findings of the report and the other materials that will be announced and introduced along with a w woman who suffers from uh, several of these conditions whose name is Paula Alford who appears in uh, the film that will be introduced at this event. Um, the real core of the campaign to end chronic pain in women is this report that's titled Chronic Pain in Women, Neglect, Dismissal, and Discrimination, and you can see its cover there. Uh, I believe it's about a 40-page report that goes into a great deal of detail on each of those aspects of those little boxes um, in that diagram and how each one of those contributes to uh, needless suffering cost and economic toll. We also have developed some policy recommendations for how to address these issues through enhanced research, education, and awareness. Um, there is a film that will be shown, a short film, about eight minutes long, um, that's titled uh, Through the Maze, Women and Pain, that inter interviews several women about their experiences. And really, regardless of the diagnosis, the experience is uh, remarkably similar. Uh, to what people, uh, women experience in the healthcare system. Our partners in this campaign, in addition to the four organizations represented here today um, through the Overlapping Conditions Alliance, have been Pfizer. Uh, Pfizer is a, a pharmaceutical company that many people know of um, through its support of awareness and research and treatment for fibromyalgia. Um, they provided the funding to the consultant groups that are listed below, uh, although the Overlapping Conditions Alliance organizations contributed in kind. We did not um, receive any remuneration, so this was purely a volunteer effort on, on the part of uh, the individual organizations. 
Um, we work closely with Rational 360, uh, a company called M2. Great Plains Productions was responsible for the film that will be shown, and Reinecke Strategic Solution uh, helped with a Capitol Hill strategy. So uh, it's been quite um, a group effort, and uh, everybody has contributed just an enormous amount to bringing these issues together in a, a way that I think will be quite compelling. And when, um, when we have this event, as we had said, it's going to target members of Congress, press people, health legislators, uh, and health policymakers. We can use the combined size of the communities that will be hopefully helped by this campaign to help alert members of Congress to this event on May 19th. And we've set up an alert here. Don't bother trying to write that URL down. It's not easier. Uh, it's not an easy one to remember. So we'll send that out in a follow-up email um, that you'll get tomorrow um, so that you don't have to take note of that. But it's a quick, easy action alert with a template letter that you can send easily to your two uh, elected U.S. Senators and your U.S. Uh, House member um, with really um, very little energy or effort required on your part, all self-addressed, and will hopefully glide through the email system pretty easily to help reinforce how many people these conditions affect and why an event like this is important to you as a voting constituent. So with that, I am going to turn over the controls uh, to Mary Lou Balweg, and hopefully that will give me a bit of a chance to look at the questions that might have been sent in already, as well as to try to get my slides working a little better for the next uh, segment that I have to do. And so Mary Lou, I'm going to transfer this over to you. Let's see if that works. Hi there. Can you hear me, Kim? I can hear you. Sound great. Wonderful. I want to thank Kim McCleary and the Seafoods Association of America for hosting this wonderful webinar. It's a great way to reach a lot of people. Um, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary this year, and when I look back on 30 years, I'm amazed at how far we've come from when women's pain didn't matter at all. Uh, to where we are now where the disease has become so complex that we realize that it's going to take quite a bit more than another 30 years to sort this out, but we're well on track, I think. Uh, the Endometriosis Association is a worldwide organization. We conduct a lot of support activities for families affected by endometriosis and the related diseases. We educate about the condition and the related conditions, and I will say there's a lot of misinformation out there now about endometriosis, which of course 30 years ago didn't even matter enough to have a single brochure or any materials. Um, we do try to reach people with accurate information, a little bit difficult, I'll explain why as we go through our slides. We also conduct a lot of research in collaboration and in our own programs. And because we started the world's first research registry on endometriosis right away in 1980, from the get-go we had solid data. So we had high credibility and we were able to help the world see that this disease was not just a disease of misplaced spots. Um, one of the many myths about endometriosis is that it affects women in their 30s and 40s, white women, thin, nervous, perfectionist, who postpone childbearing. Um, this is all myth, and unfortunately, we now have girls as young as eight and nine years old being diagnosed with endometriosis. We have effects in women all the way into their 80s. This is in large part because the disease is as much an immunological disease as an endocrine disease. Back in the 1920s, when endometriosis was first discovered, so to speak, and named, the tools to understand it as an immunological disease were simply not there. GYNs noticed that there was misplaced tissue. But today we understand that the disease is far more than misplaced tissue, truly a systemic disease, an inflammatory disease, possibly an autoimmune disease, although there's argument about that. 
the conservative estimate of the number of women and girls and a few men with endometriosis is 89 million. Important to realize that even in the U.S. only about 13 percent are diagnosed, even where awareness is highest. So the majority are simply not diagnosed. They're being told that their symptoms are in their heads or that to be a woman is to suffer and unfortunately sets that young girl and young woman up for uh, health problems for life. Um, obviously one of our missions is women, we need to take ourselves seriously, we need to take the, our daughter's health seriously and um, stop allowing ourselves to be marginalized. The annual cost, this is an estimate, likely much higher. Uh, symptomatology, a, a large list of symptoms, and this is actually not complete, but pain is the most common symptom, uh, followed by fatigue, which is a very common symptom in autoimmune diseases, and there's a very high rate of chronic fatigue immune dysfunction syndrome and fibromyalgia in women with endometriosis. GI symptoms also very common in endometriosis and many of our women get labeled irritable bowel and yet when certain treatments are done those symptoms will often go away. Age of first pelvic symptoms, uh, we actually have identified symptoms before the first pelvic symptoms but in terms of the GYN outlook on endometriosis this is what we see. And you can see that in our second registry, which is 4,000 cases, compared to our first registry, a huge jump up in the symptoms under 15. Uh, even so, those are probably underreported uh, under because so many women and girls have been taught that pain with their periods is normal. Mary um, Lou, the dis yes? Mary, can you make your slides larger by hitting, um, let's see, Help me out, Chris. How is the best way for her to do this? Slide, slide show from current slide all the way toward the left on the toolbar there. And that'll make it larger so we can see the data. There you go. Uh, there we go. Great. You see it? Yes. Oh, wonderful. Thank you, Kim. Um, you can see the very high level of disability in this disease and um, often we are counseling girls who have to be homeschooled, um, who can't make it through college, who actually we just had another suicide about a month ago. Um, what happens is the woman or girl ignores the first symptoms or society or physicians encourage her to ignore the first symptoms and it just gets worse and worse so that very often we hear from the women and girls when they're in pain almost constantly. Um, we are now unable to advance the slides. We're trying. Okay. No? That was the problem I had as well. Is that the problem you had, Kim? Um, it took us a long time to get the Social Security Administration to recognize that endometriosis could be disabling. Now we do have uh, women and girls who have been able to get Social Security disability. Of course, that only just helps them survive financially. The goal ultimately is to get them out of pain. Um, as I show on this slide on medical treatment, um, this shows that most of the treatments, and this is a phrase we use a lot, are really hit and miss. Sometimes they'll work, sometimes they'll not, sometimes they'll work for a while, or if they work they'll have such miserable side effects, Lupron is famous for that, that people have to give up on it, or we've had people actually confined to institutions because of the extreme severe drop in hormones. All of these hormonal treatments drop the level of hormones down to very, very low. Um, we are working with a, a topical essential oil mixture that our people have been able to use. It's called Proserona and actually get off narcotics. So if someone's interested in trying that, 
check out on our website or email us. Surgical treatments, the same issue, except you also have to concern yourself with the skill of the surgeons. Of course, they all do say they're the very best. <laughs> Um, and that hysterectomy will cure it, that just is not the case. Uh, alternatives have been amazingly effective and maybe looking at the disease from an immune side helps, under, helps one understand some of that. I've been recently working on a big chapter in prevention of endometriosis and a talk for the Autism One conference and have been amazed that some of these very same treatments also have been effective helpful in autism, which unfortunately is one of the birth defects that we are now seeing in the children of women with endometriosis, sons and daughters. Cancer, um, we had been hearing cancer cases from our beginning and physicians kept saying, oh, that was just uh, sporadic. Unfortunately, that is not the case. And the risk for cancer is really quite serious in the women and in their families. Uh, autoimmune diseases, um, this was published with a uh, wonderful group from the NIH that we work with. Um, I just noticed that this is not actually the right reference, but it comes up later. So we see a lot of autoimmune diseases in women with endometriosis. And this is the actual study from uh, our team at the NIH with the epidemiologist Nanette Sinai, who's wonderful. And you can see the overlap there for those women who had a coexisting disease, this is how it broke out. The endocrine diseases were primarily thyroid, a hypothyroid, and Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is autoimmune thyroid disease, and diabetes. This is part of why it's so hard dealing with endometriosis. The taboos and stigmas, I'm afraid, keep many women and girls uh, from taking it seriously themselves. Um, we identified starting in 1992 that a, a toxic chemical called dioxin was completely capable of causing endometriosis with its full immunological profile. Since then, hundreds of studies all over the world have replicated these and we now know for sure that dioxin can cause endometriosis. There likely are additional pesticides and other sources of hormonally active and immunotoxicants that definitely also can cause the disease, particularly if it is present in the mother's body. These fat-loving chemicals build up in the body, often for life, and they are there when we're pregnant. So prevention has to start um, even before we get pregnant. This whole hot area of science right now is called epigenetics. Uh, we're moving out of the age of the genome into understanding that it's the genes plus the environment is actually the environment that tells the genes what to do in many cases. Um, this is how one of our members envisioned endometriosis as this monster with claws and then I added all these other health problems that we're seeing in the women. Uh, Theo Colburn, famous for her book Our Stolen Future um, and kind of the modern Rachel Carson, uh, this is her slide showing that part of why we might be seeing what we're seeing now is that the first generation exposed in the womb has reached adulthood. Um, I always like to help people see that if this was a disease affect men, we would have some different orientations to it. And this is my Joe with Endo cartoon. He appears in all of our books. By the way, all of this is expanded in our books. Um, and the doctor says, well, the solution is, you know, castration. And uh, the slide's not here, but he says, there must be something else. And the doctor says, you men, you get so attached to your organs. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Lou. That was, uh, that was great. It was quick. <laughs> um, uh, and I've had some questions come in. I think we'll hold those until we each get through our presentations because some of them do relate to the overlap. So let's see. Mary Lou, you are going to pass the controls over to Terry. Yes. And Terry, are you ready? Yes. Okay. Terry Kelly is president of the TMJ Association, and she is going to share with us some information about tempo, temporomandibular disorders. 
Take it away, Terry. Thank you so much, Kim. And again, thank you for inviting us to participate in this wonderful webinar. TMJ, uh, I'll start off with the TMJ Association. We are a 501c3 patient advocacy organization, and our mission is to improve the quality of health care and lives of everyone affected by TMJ disorders. We all have two jaw joints called TMJs, temporomandibular joints. Each is in front of each ear, and it connects the lower jaw bone to your skull. These joints allow movement up, down, back, forward, side to side. And these are what make you able to eat, swallow food, breathe, talk, laugh, kiss, make facial expressions, etc. Temporomandibular disorders are commonly referred to as TMJ. And they're a collection of poorly understood conditions characterized by pain in the jaw, surrounding tissues, such as your neck and your shoulders, and limitations in jaw movements. TMJ is a highly complex disease. And it is mediated by genetic, hormonal influences, as well as environmental and another, a, a number of complex biological factors. Many of the people who are diagnosed with TMJ disorders actually have a number of other medical conditions and that are part of a broader multi-systems illness that go unrecognized uh, for the sake of this webinar, overlapping conditions. Approximately 35 million people in the United States suffer from TMJ problems. Both men and women are afflicted with these disorders, but approximately 90% of those seeking treatment are women in their childbearing years. As with all of these conditions, pain is what leads, leads people to treatment. Most accurately described, TMJ pain is a dull ache in the jaw joint and the nearby areas. Obviously, uh, other types of pain are always noted and reported to us, such as stabbing ear pain and stabbing pain in the ear. Other sy symptoms include pain in the neck and shoulders, as I mentioned, migraine or chronic headaches, jaw muscle stiffness, Locking of the jaw, grating of the jaw joint, a bite that feels off, ear pressure, pain, ringing in the ears, decreased hearing, division, dizziness, and vision problems. Diagnosing TMJ disorders at this point is difficult and actually confusing, both for the patients as well as for those trying to give a diagnosis to the patient. Presently, we have no widely accepted standard tests to correctly identify all the TMJ conditions. We strongly suggest that you initially consult your primary care physician to rule out other illnesses that are treated by the medical community. And uh, it's, it's, we seriously recommend this because sometimes there are tumors that are not found and the patient is put through years of TMJ treatment up to tremendously horrible effects. In most cases, uh, the diagnostic procedure includes a detailed medical history, the patient's description of symptoms, and physical examination of the head, neck, face, and jaw. And this provides information that is useful in making a diagnosis. As with all of these other conditions, the TMJ patients see multiple health care providers in their search for answers. And we have found that it takes four years for a TMJ patient to actually get a diagnosis. Not all causes of TMJ disorders are known. 
potential causes or contributing factors can be obviously trauma to the jaw area, various forms of arthritis, dental procedures. Um, I wish I had a dime for everybody who said they had a TMJ problem following wisdom tooth extraction. Genetic predisposition. Uh, we definitely are seeing research that is uh, lending uh, tremendous information in this area, which I'll talk about a little later. Hormonal influence. Low-level infections, autoimmune diseases, uh, stretching the jaw. When you have intubation and they're trying to insert a tube before surgery, uh, many patients often are introduced to a lifetime of TMJ pain through that. Clenching or grinding of the teeth. TMJ disorders are routinely excluded from medical and dental insurance plans. And when insurance companies do pay for some procedures, it is totally haphazard. For example, they may pay for surgical procedures, but they will not pay for the most um, non-invasive procedures. So it's, to say the least, haphazard or non-existent. Uh, there aren't any standardized costs for TMJ treatment. When it comes to the treatments, um, actually most of the patients who ha um, have a TMJ problem are probably going to get over it within a short period of time, weeks or months. And the simplest care is all that is usually needed to relieve this discomfort or pain. Uh, we recently conducted a survey and we listed 42 treatments and this did not include pharmaceuticals, it did not include surgical procedures. And of all of the 42 procedures or treatments rather, um, the one that was most effective and obviously helped the patient the most was a hot pack. At the same time, uh, I, it brings to mind the fact that a 1993 study showed that TMJ patients spent $32 billion a year in care. The National Institutes of Health, uh, the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research and the Office of Research on Women's Health, uh, developed the brochure, which is in front of you. If you click on those three women, you will be taken to the NIH brochure, which, as you can see, less is often best when it comes to TMJ treatments. They strongly recommend that we avoid treatments that can cause permanent changes in the bite or jaw. The NIH also in treating complex TMJ cases, those patients who do not get better with the very conservative and reversible procedures, they're often introduced to a lifetime of severe pain, jaw dysfunction, uh, disability. And in these cases, um, we really are at a loss of how to most effectively treat them. And as with a lot of these other conditions, and as you heard uh, Mary Lou discuss with endometriosis, we're sort of out here with hit and miss treatments, trial and error, something might work, might not work, it might work a little, and we're in the same boat with TMJ treatments. Some patients are helped, others are actually made worse, and others are totally unaffected. But the NIH strongly suggests that these patients require a team of experts in a number of fields, particularly neurology, rheumatology, pain management. And then when you're adding into this the overlapping conditions, uh, so many of the TMJ patients have chronic fatigue syndrome, irritable bowel syndrome. You obviously are seeing gynecologists for vulvodynia. You're seeing rheumatologists. You're seeing 
gastroenterologists, and so forth. The TMJ Association uh, co-sponsors meetings with the National Institutes of Health. And our fourth scientific meeting uh, was one where we decided we absolutely needed a paradigm shift in how we were looking at TMJ disorders. Everything was always focused on the jaw, the teeth, the face, etc. And over the years, several things became very obvious to us, talking to thousands of people for over 20 years. One of them was that the TMJ patient didn't only have a TMJ problem. When I would ask, do you have other health issues, I, I would get a litany. I have mitral valve prolapse. I have interstitial cystitis. I have fibromyalgia. And you know, it depended upon the patient. There were always other conditions that they were also dealing with in addition to TMJ. And this was, this concept was sort of validated by a Kaiser Permanente study which was published in 2000. And that study demonstrated that the TMJ patient had um, over double the healthcare utilization of the normal. And when Dr. White, the principal investigator, uh, talked to me about it, he said, Terry, normal people in this age range, when they are in the hospital, they are there to have babies. Your patients are in there with all sorts of autoimmune conditions, lupus, chronic fatigue, on and on and on. He said, this truly is an issue, and the healthcare utilization is not being uh, spent on TMJ disorders, but on other health conditions. So this meeting actually was the paradigm shift. And it was driven by our concerns, which I just talked about, that there was more to this complex condition than dysfunction of the jaw and the muscles, and that there was a diverse set of comorbid conditions found in the TMJ patients that indicated that this was a multi multifaceted disorder and that diagnostic and therapeutic procedures had to involve multidisciplinary uh, approaches. And this was validated by Dr. Kabeck, the director of the uh, National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research, when he said, TMJ disorders do not exist alone. They are part of a collection of disorders that are both influenced by, as well as influence, other medical conditions, such as chronic fatigue syndrome, cardiovascular disorders, hearing problems such as tinnitus, digestive and gastrointestinal disorders, and sleep disorders, to name a few. In short, TMJDs are part of a very complex system. We split out into um, sections at this meeting. And uh, when we got together, we all contributed conditions, overlapping conditions. And these are just some that were presented at the meeting. So in addition to uh, Kim's overlapping conditions that you uh, shared with us earlier, here are more. And, um, in talking with Dr. Maxner, who is conducted, conducting a study down at the University of North Carolina, he has, at about a year ago, nailed down 18 comorbidities with TMJ disorders. Our fifth scientific meeting, um, Can Studies of Comorbidities with TMJ Disorders Reveal Common Mechanism of Disease? was just an offshoot of the fourth one. And as you can see at the fourth meeting, we introduced everybody to the fact that, you know what, this is bigger than we ever thought it was. This is far more complex than we thought it was. And so for the fifth meeting, we focused on conditions often found to be comorbid with TMJ disorders. And represented at this meeting were the chronic headache, 
generalized pain conditions, IBS, endometriosis, interstitial cystitis, vulvodynia, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, and rheumatoid arthritis. We brought together scientists and clinicians knowledgeable about each of these complex conditions named, that I just named, but we also brought in the leaders of the advocacy groups to share their experiences, to share their, shall I say, their um, passion for what we needed to move this off dead center. And I cannot tell you how exciting this meeting was. And even though we always have had patients participate in our meetings, this was exceptional, and their contributions were great. So at this point, uh, we have come a long way from, gee, is this about your teeth or your jaws, to actually uh, having one of the most um, progressive studies going on with TMJ as the focus. Uh, it's the OPERA project, uh, Dr. Bill Maxner at the University of uh, North Carolina in Chapel Hill is the principal investigator. And uh, he is conducting a cohort study in which he has taken perfectly non-pain TMJ pain patient people and is following them over seven years. And he is going to see who develops these TMJ problems. And at this point, uh, he has had uh, more than success in having people develop TMJ disorders within this cohort. And uh, what is terrific about this is he has, um, he is collecting uh, genetic material from these people. And so we're really looking at, at the end of this project, hopefully being able to identify even genetically who may be getting a TMJ disorder in the future, we may actually find out how does an acute episode turn into a chronic one. And what he is planning to do in the future is to expand these studies and look at other overlapping conditions in the same way in, as a unit. So. Um, Sometimes when we think we don't have the research we desperately need, we actually are fortunate that we do have this major study going on. And as you can see with the um, comments on the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research website, these findings are in agreement with various case control studies which have suggested that it seems inappropriate to consider TMD in isolation. Rather, regional and widespread chronic pain conditions represent overlapping conditions and should be considered as part of a continuum than distinct entities with distinct etiologies. Hope for the TMJ patients that have joint degeneration. Um, probably another exciting area in TMJ is the bioengineering, and particularly tissue engineering and tissue regeneration. Um, a meeting that took place in November 2009 uh, was extremely exciting in that we have a group of bioengineers who are so dedicated to actually finding out everything about the TM joint. And more importantly, how can we even use our own cells to regenerate a new joint, a new disc? And I wanted to share that with you. During this meeting, uh, Dr. Bunjak Novakovic of Columbia University uh, shared with us her breakthrough in that she had actually a uh, tissue engineered bone graft grown in the exact shape of complex skull jaw joint. Now, um, obviously, we still have limitations. And as she said, we definitely have to learn how can we possibly uh, innervate, but also 
get a blood supply into this. So this is an area where it will it should be giving the TMJ patients with joint uh, degeneration disc issues hope for the future. Just a few of the other um, highlights. Uh, we have some clinical trials that are going on. And um, our song on our um, MySpace is, I want a new drug. And so for the first time, uh, Lilly Pharmaceutical Company uh, is conducting a study on Cymbalta, which is currently used for fibromyalgia, for TMJ pain. So we probably are now about to hit prime time with uh, pharmaceutical research. A little about the TMJ Association. I don't want to take much more time, but we do everything all of the other organizations do. Uh, our main passion is to get the best darn science this country can give to this disorder. We desperately need it, and we advocate um, passionately for that. We definitely feel awareness is important, and we are doing our level best to get the word out. This is not just a click and a pop. This is far more complex. We hope to give the uh, most credible information through our website and our publications to the patients, to the public, anybody who is interested in, about, in TMJ disorders. And lastly, um, we care about the patients the most. And we have a support network where we provide empathetic uh, support and information uh, with our patients. Lastly, tmjassociation.org. We invite you to visit it to learn more about us and about temporal mandibular disorders. Thank you again, Kim, and my colleagues. Thank you, Terry. Um, there have been a number of questions that have come in for both Mary Lou and Terry. And again, I'm going to hold those to the end, and hopefully we can get to some of them. Um, I hope want to just reemphasize, I've sent some messages out uh, because this question came up several times. Both the slides and the recording of the program will be posted on the web uh, later this week and we'll make the URLs available to you in a follow-up email. So no worries. I know several people uh, wanted longer to look at Mary Lou's slides in particular as she uh, moved through them quickly and you'll have that opportunity um, when we get them posted up on the web. Chris Veasley is our, our next speaker. She is Associate Director of the National Vulvodynia Association. And Terry, it looks like you've given the controls over to Chris. Yep, I'm here. OK. Thank you, Karen, everybody. A few people have asked if the speakers could speak up, that the uh, volume or uh, voice audio is a little low. OK. Um, today, I just wanted to briefly cover some of the basics of vulvodynia. As Kim mentioned, I'm the Associate Director of the National Vulvodynia Association, and you can learn more about our group on the web at nva.org. Um, the definition of vulvodynia is chronic vulvar pain without an identifiable cause. So the pain location, the consistency or constancy of the pain, and the severity can vary among women. Burning is the most commonly reported symptom, but descriptions do vary. Some women describe it as feeling like acid is being poured on their skin or like a constant knife-like stabbing pain. And there are two subtypes of vulvodynia that sometimes coexist, and there is some discrepancy in the medical community about whether these are actually separate um, conditions or subtypes of vulvodynia or whether they exist on a continuum or a spectrum of severity, whereas one woman might start off with having uh, localized pain upon touch or pressure only and then as time goes on um, develop a more severe uh, constant pain that you see in generalized vulvodynia. So just briefly, provoked vestibulodynia, which is hard enough to pronounce as it is, is also called vulvar vestibulitis syndrome. 
And this occurs when pain is limited just to the vestibule, the area surrounding the opening of the vagina. It occurs during or after pressure is applied to the vestibule, so with intercourse, tampon insertion, gynecological exams, um, or with sitting, bike riding, women will get the pain. Usually during um, the day when they're going about their everyday activities and working, there isn't a lot of, of pain experience. Whereas with generalized vulvodynia, this is more indicative of uh, nerve damage or a nerve problem, uh, where the pain is oftentimes with generalized the vulva, so it's not just at that vestibular area. It can be anywhere within um, the perineum, the, the other vulvar areas, the inner thighs, the buttocks. Sometimes it goes up into the lower abdomen also. And this pain is um, relatively constant, but there can be some periods of relief. And typically, symptoms or ex, um, things that would um, would exacerbate pain and vestibulitis also occur with generalized vulvodynia. So while women may have a certain level of pain um, all the time, if they do bike ride or sit for long periods of time, they likely experience a flare. Just some quick facts and figures about vulvodynia. Um, many years ago, the, the medical community thought that this condition was very rare and that it only affected Caucasian women. And we now know from several NIH-funded population-based studies that 3 to 7 percent of reproductive aged women suffer from vulvodynia. Um, we also know that um, many girls uh, suffer from the condition. So one recent adult study um, found that the symptom onset is highest between the ages of 18 and 25. And that doesn't mean that women who are older or younger than that um, don't experience vulvodynia. It just typically means that that is when the symptoms will start. And a recent study of adolescents aged 12 to 19 suggests that it's also quite prevalent in teens. Um, again, many years ago, this was primarily considered a Caucasian or a white woman's disease. And we now know from several NIH-funded studies also that um, African-American and Hispanic women are just as likely to develop vulvodynia. And like all the other conditions that we've talked about today and all the ones that we haven't um, covered, misdiagnosis is very common. Sixty percent of women report visiting three or more health care providers to receive a diagnosis, and 40 percent of them remain undiagnosed after three medical consults. So what causes vulvodynia? Well, right now we really don't know um, what the cause or causes are. As with the other conditions we've talked about, there's not likely one particular cause, but many ways by which a woman can develop vulvodynia. Um, and the research community proposes that one or the following um, may cause or contribute to vulvodynia, which include an injury or an irritation of the nerves that transmit pain from the vulva. That's mainly the pedendal nerve an increase in the number of pain-sensing nerve fibers in the vulva. And actually, recent studies have shown when they take tissue samples from women who have the provoked vestibulodynia um, subtype, that they have 10 to 15 times the number of pain-sensing nerve fibers per um, given area of tissue than normal women. So you can understand why women would experience severe pain with just touch or pressure in the area. There may be elevated levels of inflammatory substances in the vulva that can um, irritate those very sensitive nerve fibers. There may be an abnormal response of certain cells, like immunological cells, to environmental factors, um, such as infection, whereas one woman may develop a vulval vaginal infection, like yeast or bacterial vaginosis. Her body uh, mounts an immune response, uh, heals the infection, and then clears all of the inflammation out of the tissue and goes back to normal. In women with vulvodynia, we find that those types of activities actually lead to a prolonged inflammatory state. Um, and then again, as Terry had mentioned with TMJ, there's a lot of recent evidence suggesting that genetics um, influence a woman's susceptibility to developing vulvodynia, whether in general she may be more sensitive to developing a prolonged inflammation or whether she's just predisposed to having um, more body pain. Um, there's also some recent data coming out of Cornell University looking at uh, women's inability to combat uh, vulvovaginal infection. 
And oftentimes women with vulvodynia, we don't know which comes first, whether the vulvodynia comes first or the pelvic floor muscle problems come first. But there's oftentimes an associated pelvic floor muscle weakness, spasm, or instability. So we, we know from recent research that many conditions um, do overlap with vulvodynia, including interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome, uh, TMJ, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, and some animal studies have linked uh, vulvar and vaginal pain to endometriosis. Now the list is much longer than this. These, I just included the ones that have actually been researched to date. So the question is why and how are they related? And there's many theories that are quite complicated and we really don't have a lot of time to get into into them today in this webinar, but I invite you to visit this website uh, where there is a complete literature review, at least from the studies that have been conducted in the vulvodynia population, which explain a little bit more about some of the theories behind how these conditions may be related, whether it's genetics or inflammatory processes, dysfunction in the muscle, muscular system. So how is vulvodynia diagnosed? Um, there's a lot of confusion, again, about what vulvodynia is because the word itself is not a diagnosis. It's really a symptom. Vulvodynia just simply means pain of the vulva. So you can have pain in the vulvar area for a number of reasons, but you're only diagnosed with this condition when you've had vulvar pain for more than three to six months and all known causes for a woman's pain are ruled out. So for example, if you had a yeast or bacterial infection and you had some prolonged discomfort or irritation with that, but it went away after three or four weeks, you're not, you don't have vulvodynia. Or if you had maybe some pain following um, vaginal childbirth that went away after three or four months, that's not diagnosed as vulvodynia. So when you have this chronic vulvar problem and you've had every test known to mankind done on you and no, no known causes can be found for why you're experiencing pain, then you're you would be diagnosed with vulvar vulvodynia. Your first, a woman's first examination should include a very thorough medical history, a vulval vaginal examination to rule out skin disorders and other types of conditions that can cause vulvar pain. There should be cultures taken for yeast, bacterial infections, and other types of, of infection. Some providers, depending on your age and hormonal status, will do a blood draw to assess levels of estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone because that can cause changes in the vulval vaginal tissue and lead to uh, pain in that area. And then typically, as you see pictured on the right, you'll have a Q-tip test. And this is just a very simple test where um, a practitioner will take a, Q a moist Q-tip and he or she will touch different areas in the vulva and ask you to rate the pain on a scale of 0 to 10. And again, as we had discussed before, with the increased number of nerve fibers um, that are found in women with vulvodynia, it doesn't take much pressure from a Q-tip to elicit quite a bit of pain. So when we got, talk about treatment, there's some several points to remember. Because vulvodynia is a pain condition that affects the genital area, but it often involves the pelvic floor muscles, experts favor a multidisciplinary disciplinary approach to its treatment. So that means any particular woman could be um, <coughs> under the care of a vulvovaginal specialist, a gynecologist, a vulvar dermatologist, a pain management specialist, neurologist, physical therapist, and the list goes on from there. Um, because we don't know what causes vulvodynia, treatment is really geared towards alleviating symptoms and provides partial or complete relief. No single treatment is appropriate for all women. Again, because we don't know the different causes for vulvodynia, we don't know which treatments are effective for which subgroups of women. And as research moves forward, we're starting to understand that a little bit. Um, some women may experience great relief with one treatment, while another woman um, doesn't have any pain relief with that, or the side effects of that particular treatment may be unacceptable and um, force her to, to stop it. And finding a treatment or combination of treatments that help to alleviate vulvar pain is usually a process of trial and error. It usually takes months, um, months to find you know, what combination of treatments may work for you. Just um, to briefly give you an overview of some of the major uh, classifications of treatments that are used for vulvodynia, um, the first step is always discontinuing any use um, of anything that could possibly irritate the sensitive vulvar tissue. So 
douches, perfumed soaps, um, bubble baths. Um, you know, people recommend using 100% cotton underwear. I mean, we have a full list of these types of things on our website, which you can visit. Um, but that's always the first step in making sure that you know the, the tissue is already um, sensitive, not to irritate it further, or to make sure that one of or more of those things aren't causing the pain to begin with. Then, uh, usually, the first step is to uh, prescribe an oral pain blocking medication, whether that be a tricyclic antidepressant like Elevil or nortriptyline, uh, the newer SNRIs like Cymbalta, um, anticonvulsants such as uh, Neurontin or Lyrica. And in severe cases, or while uh, a woman is titrating up to an effective level of some of these other medications, opioids may be prescribed. Um, some of the newer uh, treatment approaches include topical medications and, and specifically um, compounding um, topical creams or ointments from these medications that you can take by mouth. And the idea there is that if you can block the, um, the, the pain messages coming from the local tissue um, by using something on the vulvar area, instead of taking these medications by mouth, you can get away with um, not having a lot of the central side effects of sedation, dry mouth, and other problems that women have taking these by mouth. We don't have a lot of research on how effective these are. Sometimes women are so in so much pain that just applying some of these formulations to the vulva exacerbates the problem. But for, for, for some women, it is helpful to use a topical uh, formulation, either alone or in combination with another treatment category. Um, oftentimes, women with vulvodynia will have some sort of pelvic floor muscle therapy. And again, as I mentioned before, we don't know whether the pelvic floor problems come first uh, before the vulvodynia or in some cases come afterwards. But your body's normal um, me protective mechanism is that when you're in pain, you will tense your muscles to guard that area from further hurt. And a lot of us aren't very conscientious about what we're doing with our pelvic floor at any given time during the day. So if you're experiencing pain with intercourse or pain when you sit um, in the vulvar area, it's very common that you will start to um, tense and, and your, tense up your pelvic floor muscles and that they will go into spasm. So there's a lot of different physical therapy modalities and biofeedback um, that can be used to normalize the function of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, when these things, when these categories of treatment um, fail, women usually can go on to have nerve blocks, whether that's a pedendal nerve block or like an epidural that you would receive during childbirth. The idea behind this is it kind of resets the um, pain, like an electrical circuit, it kind of resets the um, pain transmission circuit in your body. And sometimes after a series of these, women can have sustained pain relief. Neurostimulation, um, like Interstim is another option that, um, when implanted, substitutes the pain uh, that you feel with kind of a, a tingling sensation. Um, and there's not a lot of research on either of these um, modalities, but some of them have been helpful for women with vulvodynia. And for a sub subgroup of women who have provoked vestibulodynia only, again, that's pain um, in the vestibule only with touch or pressure, um, a surgery to remove that painful tissue can be beneficial. So I've been involved in the vulvodynia community for 15 years now. And looking back over um, this amount of time, it, it really is amazing how much uh, further are, along we are than when we started 15 years ago. But there's so much more that needs to be done in order for us to understand the causes of vulvodynia and how to effectively treat different um, subgroups of women with the condition. Right now, or to date, the National Institutes of Health and the Canadian Institutes of Health Research have supported a total of 24 vulvodynia studies. Our group um, does fund medical research. We've supported about a half a million dollars of research, uh, equivalent to about 27 pilot studies. And a combined total of 23 research studies are going on right now. And they're investigating all aspects of the disorder, from prevalence and risk factors up to uh, the overlapping conditions, etiology, uh, vulvodynia subtypes, and the causes. And I included some links on the bottom of the page, uh, and our slides will be available to you later if you'd like to learn more about and uh, read more about the study summary of studies that are ongoing or have taken place in the past. Just a little bit about the NVA. Um, we were established in 1994. We're the only international organization that serves 
women with vulvodynia and healthcare providers who treat the disorder. Um, we have four main areas of education, support, advocacy, and research. We develop and distribute educational resources to patients and the public. Uh, we coordinate patient services, such as a patient support network and medical professional referrals. We have online learning programs for patients and uh, medical professionals, and our um, CME, it, the medical professional course is CME accredited for healthcare providers. We attend national conferences to educate providers. We advocate for increased federal funding of vulvodynia research and award pilot grants. We have a career development award for junior investigators so that we can grow the number of people uh, in the field who are qualified to adequately diagnose and treat vulvodynia. And we work with the media pr to promote public awareness of the condition. And that's just a partial list of the things that we, we do every day. And I invite you to visit our website at nva.org to learn more about the NVA and vulvodynia. So I am passing it off to Kim, correct? That's correct. Thank you, Chris. Okay. And a few other questions have come in about uh, the availability of the slides um, and the recording after the webinar. And yes, uh, both will be available. And OK. And we'll provide the URLs. I think <clears throat> probably you'll be able to find them in more than one place. So we'll send you the URLs in a follow-up email message uh, that you should receive sometime tomorrow afternoon. Okay, um, I hope you've all gathered from the three presentations before this one um, just how uh, multifaceted these conditions are and how much work we have um, to, to be done both in terms of the individual conditions and the way in which the symptoms and characteristics and the experience of having these conditions uh, overlaps. Um, so before we get to the, the Q's and the A's that have come in, I will give you just a, a brief overview of chronic fatigue syndrome and the CFIDS association. And I'm hoping my slides will cooperate better than they did before. And they don't seem to be. Darn it. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. It worked yesterday. Um, there. Um, chronic fatigue syndrome, aside from the rather obvious and trivializing name um, of being persistent fatigue or exhaustion with a collection of other symptoms is really a much more disabling and severe condition than its name would indicate. Um, it is characterized by incapacitating fatigue, and, and we use that descriptor because this is not the everyday tiredness that even healthy people might experience by Friday afternoon of a busy week. This is that kind of bone deep exhaustion that you experience uh, with the worst flu you can imagine with other conditions um, under circumstances that are, that are quite unusual. This is a, a fatigue that causes individuals to have to choose between sitting at the table with their family for a meal or taking a shower in a day. Um, so this is, is not just, um, you know, feeling tired and it is too often confused with the symptom of fatigue. Chris had mentioned this in, in her presentation about vulvodynia, that fatigue is a symptom that's common in many, many, most medical disorders. Um, and if you think of it as a bio alarm for something going wrong in the body, um, this level of fatigue is really uh, quite, uh, I've heard doctors use the word impressive in its severity and its um, duration. And you have to have these symptoms, including the fatigue, for at least six months to fit the current um, quote-unquote case definitions 
for CFS and six months is a long time to feel absolutely miserable um, before getting a, a diagnosis. So um, one of our goals is actually to move toward earlier identification and early detection of CFS so that it doesn't have to persist for months before people can even get so much as a diagnosis. Um, with the fatigue that's experienced as the exhaustion plus very poor stamina come a constellation of other symptoms and characteristics. Um, and perhaps most disabling is the problems that come with it uh, in terms of concentration, information processing, and short-term memory. Um, there are also a number of flu-like symptoms. So again, if you think of the worst flu you've ever had, the joint and muscle pain um, the, that can migrate, it may be in the arms and the legs one day and in the abdomen and the head the next day, and it may also change in intensity um, over time and, and also from person to person. Unrefreshing sleep is experienced almost universally, and that can take the form of difficulty falling asleep, staying asleep, or both. But the end result is you wake in the morning and you feel no sense of refreshment or um, restorative feelings after sleep. Um, and people have to address this through a combination of um, approaches that we'll talk about in a couple minutes. Also, just like the flu, the tender lymph nodes, usually in the neck and armpits, which is, again, a sign of, of some kind of inflammatory process taking place. And many people, uh, when they experience uh, a relapse, the, the nodes get big and swollen, and they can feel those instantly as the sign that the rest of the symptoms are going to follow. Um, sore throat, not a, a big prominent symptom, but certainly there. And again, another indicator of an infectious or inflammatory process. And headaches. Um, come with this, and they are described as being of a new or different type. So if you previously had tension headaches uh, at the end of every day, now with the CFS and the other symptoms, you're feeling a pressure-like headache, a migraine headache, uh, one that's in the front or one that's confined to one side, but a different pattern or type of headache than was previously uh, experienced. Perhaps the most distinctive symptom uh, of CFS, and one that we're devoting a lot of research attention to, is something called post-exertional relapse, or post-exertional malaise, PEM, or uh, post-exertion. Um, and that is a worsening of all of the symptoms, um, following even very minimal physical or mental exertion that occurs sometimes uh, with a delayed reaction but requires an extended recovery period. So something that um, might be taken for granted like a, a trip to the mailbox or um, driving a child to school could put somebody back in bed for uh, days if not weeks. Some of the other common features and symptoms are a difficulty maintaining upright posture, dizziness, balance, fainting, and I responded to a couple of questions from people about this uh, orthostatic intolerance, uh, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, and neurally mediated hypotension, all big long names for uh, just difficulty uh, between the heart and the brain regulating the blood pressure. And uh, this has been pretty well studied in CFS, and I'm not sure how well um, it's been recognized in some of the other conditions, but it is certainly a key in the diagnosis and treatment area for uh, alleviating uh, you know, some of the symptom complex. Um, visual disturbances, which tend not to get a lot of attention but are very common in CFS, including blurring, light sensitivity, eye pain, difficulty focusing, um, having to have like three or four different prescriptions for your glasses because your eyes uh, seem to change all the time is quite common. Chills and night sweats, which indicate uh, an inability for the body to regulate its temperature. And again, another sign that um, there's something kind of going wrong within the autonomic nervous system. Um, GI problems are very common, and those can take the form of irritable bowel syndrome or individual symptoms of pain, bloating, diarrhea, um, difficulty uh, digesting food properly. 
um, and sometimes the result or contribute to allergies and sensitivities to foods, odors, chemicals, and medications. And most people who have CFS have to start with very, very small doses of medications um, because they experience the side effects at much lower doses than uh, healthy people or people with other conditions. Um, I mentioned earlier the brain fog and cognitive impairment, um, and if you think of that flu-like feeling where you just can't even think straight and, you know, you sort of have to remember to put one foot in front of the other, um, this is a very impairing, uh, disabling feature of CFS and quite common and uh, has not been studied as well as it should be given the disability that is associated with it. Um, Often there are um, psychological symptoms in terms of irritability, mood swings, and anxiety that come with this or are more pronounced uh, perhaps in the periods of relapse. Certainly um, understandable given the amount of disability and um, impairment that this condition causes and uh, oftentimes a problem in the diagnostic and the treatment setting uh, with doctors wanting to write off all the symptoms to psychological factors. Uh, and then finally, and uh, Chris did a great job covering some of these issues, the gynecologic problems. They're very common in women um, with CFS and seem to increase over time, particularly um, in the menopausal years, and there were a couple questions about that. Um, but younger women may experience uh, premenstrual syndrome and endometriosis, and then um, there are also problems or, or characteristics uh, among women during pregnancy, some women get much better. Uh, their CFS resolves um, during pregnancy and other women get much worse. And then the uh, after delivery, the issues kind of vary. But again, pointing to uh, the endocrine system and the HPA axis uh, being contributing to the condition. Um, we've already talked a lot about the common comorbidities, so I won't spend much time on those, um, and you've, you've heard a lot about uh, a few of them. Um, I did want to point out this article, uh, which appeared for the spring issue of um, the American uh, Academy of Pain Practitioners. Um, and it's a, about a four-page article that provides a great overview of chronic fatigue syndrome, um, and we'll include that link in your follow-up email as well. I think this is going to be a long email, so be ready for it. Uh, in terms of what do we know, what can we say with confidence more along the epidemiologic lines about CFS? Um, right now, the diagnosis is made based on a characteristic symptom pattern. Um, based on all of those symptoms that I described, there are actually uh, seven different case definitions. Possibly two of them get more attention currently than the others, but um, it is possible to diagnose CFS, and people who spend a lot of their uh, medical practice taking care of CFS patients refer to it as sort of like the um, first few chords of, of Beethoven's fifth. Um, you just have to hear those notes, and you know what is going to follow, because the, the pattern is really quite uh, distinctive. But you also uh, need to go through a careful process uh, that can be very time-consuming time-consuming and expensive to exclude other possible causes to make sure that there are not things like hypothyroid, um, cancers, MS that could be um, responsible for the symptoms or contributing to the symptom pattern, um, especially thinking about things like sleep apnea. Um, I mentioned hypothyroidism that might be treatable that could at least relieve a layer of symptoms from the overall complex. But as of uh, right this moment, there is no single test to make the diagnosis of CFS, although uh, there's a lot of research focused in that direction. We know that at least one million Americans are affected and millions more worldwide. Um, the worldwide prevalence, uh, there's a, a lot of different numbers thrown around, and again, it kind of all goes back to which case definition you're using to define it. Um, but only about 20% of the at least American population have been diagnosed, and that low rate of diagnosis uh, certainly shows a need for increased awareness and understanding among not only healthcare professionals, but uh, the individuals experiencing the symptoms because they get bounced around a lot as uh, each of us have described. Um, 
studies have shown that about 25% of CFS patients are completely disabled, and many of those homebound or bedbound. But by definition, CFS is disabling. You have to be uh, unable to fulfill sort of normal everyday activities in order to meet the definition. So um, sort of by definition, CFS is disabling. It does occur four times more commonly in women than men, and again, that may go back to autoimmune issues or uh, the endocrine system, and uh, probably has something to do with the etiology in terms of different cortisol receptors or uh, estrogen receptors um, that make women more vulnerable to this than men. It's most frequently diagnosed uh, between sort of in the middle ages, although as I creep past those numbers, that's becoming more like youth than middle age or old age. But it can affect people of all ages, including teens. Um, it's much more difficult to make the diagnosis in younger children, but uh, they have also uh, been diagnosed. Uh, so it really affects kind of across the lifespan. And as others have indicated, CFS occurs in all ethnic and racial groups, so that old yuppie flu moniker is really uh, a myth, and it occurs at all income and education levels, so it knows no boundaries and doesn't target in on one socioeconomic group um, more than another. It does occur in families, particularly mother-daughter pairs, suggesting a genetic link with common exposures. In terms of treatment, uh, CFS treatment sort of follows what some of my colleagues have said. Um, you have to take it almost uh, symptom by symptom, and most CFS clinical experts will start with sleep because, as everybody knows, when you don't sleep well, you don't feel well, and your pain is increased, and when your pain is increased, you don't sleep well, and when you don't sleep well, your pain is increased, and you get into this kind of uh, cycle that's very difficult to break. Um, so most of the time, you take a combination of uh, behavioral approaches in terms of good sleep hygiene and also medications to try to regulate sleep and make sleep as restorative as possible. And oftentimes that may involve a sleep study to look for things like uh, sleep apnea and other um, sleep disorders. Also addressing pain, as uh, several of my other colleagues have noted, um, muscular, joint, nerve, headache, body ache, pain, all may be treated by a variety of approaches. And this um, again, just to stress is really kind of the art of medicine and working closely with a healthcare professional who understands you and is willing to sort of take a trial and error approach because there's no one quick uh, pill that can be prescribed or approach that can be, um, you know, just sort of dictated across the board. Each individual seems to respond to these things quite differently, as uh, Chris pointed out. Um, treating the dysautonomia or orthostatic intolerance um, is important if it's there, and that can be evaluated uh, with a tilt test that's performed by a cardiologist or an electrophysiologist to see if your blood pressure regulation is normal. And if not, that may also require a combination of medications and um, using things like increased salt in your diet and increased uh, fluids and um, support hose and uh, things that can help pump the blood back up to the uh, top of your body rather than pooling in the extremities. Also assessing uh, chronic or reactivated infections and treating those appropriately with antivirals and antibiotics. Uh, and in CFS right now, sort of the hot research topic is a retrovirus uh, called XMRV that was associated with CFS for the first time uh, with a paper that came out in Science uh, in October of 2009. So that's receiving a lot of attention, and uh, we await uh, additional studies on that. Also, uh, relieving any aggravating conditions that are present in terms of allergy, uh, depression, um, and things like that that might be contributing but may not be fully responsible for uh, the syndrome. Um, one of the most uh, important things for patients to do is to develop a pacing or an energy envelope approach to activity and bed rest to avoid sort of what uh, most patients refer to in one way or another as a push-crash cycle where you have a good day and you try to make up for lost time and that lands you back in bed and then you are relapsed for several days until you feel well enough to try something and uh, the cycle repeats itself. Um, and we have a lot of information on our site about um, 
pacing and, and the importance of that in, in just trying to, uh, you know, be as functional as possible. And then things like maintaining just general health in terms of nutrition, not smoking, uh, it may look like smoking is important, but it's not, uh, not smoking, uh, supplementing the diet with vitamins, um, vitamin D deficiency has been something that's received some attention in CFS and getting appropriate sunlight, regulating circadian rhythm um, through uh, regular um, exposure to the sun. And then finally, uh, something that everybody with all of these conditions has to deal with is coping with the losses and the changing abilities and roles um, that these chronic conditions really uh, enforce on lives not only of the patient but their family members and the, those that care about them as well. Um, I won't spend too much time on etiology uh, other than to say it's, it's complicated and I stole this slide from my colleague uh, Suzanne Vernon who is our scientific director. Um, as part of this webinar series we have a number of um, webinars that are available in recorded fashion on our website that go into more depth about each of the areas uh, that Suzanne has nicely laid out in this graphic. Um, because the symptoms sort of all point to a multi-system, multi-factorial, um, 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 both etiology and impact on the body. And the endocrine pathways, the sympathetic nervous system, the immune system, the sensory pathways, um, the gut, the heart, the blood vessels, all these things, uh, there is evidence to support their involvement in CFS. So that's kind of a whole webinar in itself. slide won't go again. Ah, there we go. Um, just a few points about the CFITS Association of America. Uh, we were founded in 1987 initially as a local support group in Charlotte, North Carolina and since that time have grown to be the largest and most active charitable organization dedicated to conquering CFS. Um, our programs really focus in the area of research, policy and awareness. Um, and like my colleagues, we provide resources to a variety of different audiences um, and have a great deal of information on our, our website and our Facebook page and um, a YouTube channel and be happy to uh, have you all visit those areas for more information. We have um, invested about $28 million in initiatives um, to bring an end to the pain, disability, and suffering caused by CFS and have funded about $5 million in research um, since 1987 and currently have uh, an expanded research program that we actually uh, spent some time focusing on a webinar given yesterday. So hopefully uh, some of you will be interested and will take advantage of the fact that we've got some webinars archived on our site to give you more information about that. And just a plug for the webinar series because I know uh, many of the people who uh, signed up for today's um, program have um, fibromyalgia or widespread muscle and joint pain as part of the symptom complex that they experience. And Dr. Chuck Lapp, who's a leading CFS clinician uh, who also cares for uh, people with many of these conditions, is giving a webinar on May 20th um, about treatment. And we didn't get into much detail on treatment today, um, but we've got that. And then some other programs coming up here. Again, you can find that on our website, which will be uh, in the follow-up email you receive. So I think that's the end of my slides. Yeah. Okay, ladies. Um, so I am going to go back and try to capture some of these questions. Do I have my colleagues on the line? Chris, Terry, Mary Lou? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, uh, the first one I'm going to go back to actually came in for Mary Lou. I'm trying to get back up to it. Uh, sorry, the question panel here is tiny. Mary Lou, is there any treatment for internal scarring due to endometriosis and surgery? Uh, and the person asks because she's been told that it, all of that is related just to endometriosis. 
Um, scar tissue and adhesions are one of the most frustrating and difficult things to deal with. We've recently uh, covered a little bit of work with pelvic floor uh, physical therapy, which has uh, help some women with internal scarring. Um, beyond that, no one has really found an answer to this yet. Um, we find just as this person's been told that sometimes surgeons will say, well, that's due to the endometriosis or that's due to the surgery. It's pretty difficult to tell. Uh, endometriosis itself is an inflammatory condition, so you'll typically have inflammation um, in the abdomen and, and many other parts of the body. So it's not clear what this physician might be meaning when they're saying that. I would suggest, um, we always use the phrase, doing your homework, because just as you had on your slide, Kim, for chronic fatigue syndrome, and I think someone else had a similar slide, sometimes improving your health overall, specific to, in this case, endometriosis, can really make a difference. Um, I know some of us have done things. I had chronic fatigue syndrome myself. I was completely bedridden. And at that time, it wasn't even called the yuppie flu yet. But what I did was go back to my complete health regimen and eventually got back on my feet. This person is also welcome to give us a call at the association, and we'll try to help. Okay, thanks. Uh Mary Lou, one, uh, one other question. How does, and I may not pronounce this correctly, how does adenomyosis relate to endometriosis? Um, adenomyosis is defined as the inside lining of the uterus growing into the muscular wall. It's very painful. Um, it's confined to the uterus. It used to be called internal endometriosis versus the way we define endometriosis, strictly speaking now gynecologically, as outside of the uterus. But recently there's been some interesting work that shows a pretty high prevalence of adenomyosis in endometriosis. And we still have physicians around the world who insist it really is the same disease. Um, a couple treatments are beginning to emerge for adenomyosis, but it's still a very murky area. Thank you, Mary Lou. Uh, Terry, uh, someone has asked, can TMJ cause tinnitus? We certainly don't have scientific um, research that yields how it does cause tinnitus. On the other hand, uh, it seems to be one of those strong comorbidities that we hear from the patients. Uh, we also hear about uh, ear fullness, so you're, you have water in your ears and sinus type uh, pressure. So those are the conditions that ENTs mostly uh, see in a TMJ patient. But we're convinced there is a relationship, but scientifically speaking, uh, we don't quite have the answers. And again, it may end up being brain mediated. Okay, and another question about TMJ. If it is caused by trauma, are other conditions still expected or considered? I'm sorry, I didn't. Would you repeat that? Sure. Again? If, if TMJ is caused by trauma, are other conditions still expected or considered? You mean other overlapping conditions, I presume. Uh, that's what I'm... I'm you know, I, um, in reading some literature just the other day, I think we have a certain number of people that have trauma to the jaw, and that is the extent of what they are going to experience. And we typically find that with males who have had, um, you know, they are a policeman that has been assaulted, um, somebody working in an emergency room, and a uh, patient flails out. And it seems that with these people, it is focused strictly on the jaw-face area. With 
especially the women, we find that trauma can certainly occur and be a factor. On the other hand, there's a lot more of this insidious creeping on of pain. It begins and uh, just doesn't go away and is exacerbated by nothing in particular. OK. Uh, Chris, I have a question for you. Is vulvodynia the same as being told you have a narrow vaginal opening? Um, no. And again, this is where we get to a little bit of confusion because you can have any number of vulvar conditions, um, one of which could be narrowing of the vaginal opening, which is sometimes brought on by dermatologic conditions like lichen sclerosis, where the tissue can actually um, adhere to each other and narrow the opening of the urethra where urine comes out and the vagina. And that can be very painful. So it's a dermatologic vulvar condition that causes vulvar pain, but it's not quote unquote vulvodynia. With that said, um, there are specific treatments for lichen sclerosis and other dermatologic and infectious conditions that can uh, um, impact the vulvar area, but the pain management approach for those conditions is very much similar to the pain management approach that uh, I went through for vulvodynia. Okay. And um, can, Chris, can you comment on any link there might be between endocrine disorders such as diabetes, hyperinsulinemia, and vestibulitis? Well, that's it's a little bit hard to comment on that because we really have very little research on that. But we do know in general that diabetes um, can cause uh, peripheral neur neuropathy. Um, in, in, in any area of the body. So sometimes, and this ha also happens following chemotherapy for cancer, you can have um, nerve changes in your fingers, your toes, and any other part of your body, which theoretically can include the pedendal nerve, which provides pain sensation from the vulva. So um, theoretically, that is a possibility, um, although I can't speak specifically to any research or medical journals that have reported on that. Okay. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to answer a question about CFS that's come in. Uh, why is CFS always blamed on mononucleosis? Um, early on when CFS was first described, or actually when uh, there were some cluster outbreaks of, of chronic fatiguing illness that occurred in um, different places in the country, uh, most notably in Klein Village, Nevada, and Lindenville, New York. Um, initially, they thought that this was some chronic form of mono that's caused by the Epstein-Barr virus. Um, that was sort of ruled out as a cause for the syndrome itself, but EBV continues to be studied as a uh, trigger. And what some research from the uh, Australian, an Australian group has found that about 10% of people who come down with uh, any number of different acute infections, including Epstein-Barr virus or mononucleosis, will not recover from that uh, acute infection and they go on to have long-term persistent symptoms that are consistent with chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, and this is true of Q fever, Ross River virus, uh, a weird thing called chikungunya. Um, uh, SARS has a, a, a chronic illness even. Uh, have, there have been a couple of case reports of um, failure to recover from H1N1 flu. Um, so there may be something in the immune system that is making it difficult for uh, perhaps genetically predisposed individuals to recover from acute, um, very widespread common infections. Um, and this is something that is a focus of, of a great deal of research. Um, here's a question that is actually sort of more geared to all of us is, is how can individuals get involved in um, raising awareness about these conditions, um, a, about the need for healthcare professionals to do better by these patient populations and people who in particular have uh, several diagnoses. I'll let somebody else uh, take a stab at that one. 
This is Chris. I would say that um, you'll be receiving an email from our groups, regardless, independent of which organization or organizations you receive information from. You will be dis disseminating an email in the next couple of days with the first of what we hope to be many um, action alerts uh, for you to contact your members of Congress to let them know that this is an issue that's important um, to his or her constituents. And the first step along that way is to get uh, the members to attend the event that we're having on May 19th to really educate them that this is a major issue um, for our country and it's something that uh, needs action. And, um, and individually, as we move forward with this campaign to end chronic pain in women, we'll be you know, returning and asking you to, to contact your members of Congress. And then each individual organization also has uh, its own activities on Capitol Hill to increase research and awareness for each of the individual conditions. And so you can support our organizations and our efforts to do that by, um, again, donating or, or um, contacting your members of Congress. Uh, this is Mary Lou Balwig. I would strongly ask everyone to um, stop being silent. I find that women uh, think that they're being strong they're there for their families, my children come first, and don't realize that if they don't speak up, if they don't help validate and legitimize the conditions that we have, we are part of allowing the next generation to suffer. And as we're seeing, that suffering is growing exponentially. One third of all children now have chronic diseases. So it's not being a good woman to be silent about these things. We deserve help. So the thing that I find most commonly with women with uh, female-related problems, although as you heard in my talk, endometriosis is far more than that, is that they don't speak up about it. I'm sure that's true for some of the other conditions. And it's true that some people will blame it on us. Some people will stigmatize us. But for the sake of other women, for the sake of ourselves, for the sake of our daughters and our sons, we simply have to speak up. If this is what's been given to us in life, then I feel that those of us who have these conditions have to speak up and say, enough already. That's the biggest way you can contribute. And of course, as Chris said, we all need donations. We're all uh, living on shoestrings in these organizations and could do so much more with some contributions, both funds and volunteer help. This is Terry. Obviously, I endorse what Chris and Mary Lou have said. Um, in thinking about the question, uh, I believe the person asked, how can we um, basically educate uh, the professionals? And for us, it is an incredible problem, as I'm sure it is for all of the other organizations. Um, information on our websites is probably as accurate and uh, credible as you're going to get. We have many links to the uh, National Institutes of Health Information and so forth. We always encourage those who contact us, please print out anything you want. Take it with you and educate your professional provider. We don't have the money to, con to conduct uh, CME courses. We wish we did. And uh, as Mary Lou said, you know, we have to empower ourselves as not just patients but consumers of health care. Take the information, ask questions, ask your physician to read the information. Um, get back to you by email or phone or plan another visit with them. But um, with the advent of the internet and the information available, uh, it has ended up being our job to educate professionals. And I will, uh, I'm busy trying to answer some last individual questions here, um, but I will, you know, just again echo what my colleagues have said and um, that's why all of us put kind of our blood, sweat, tears, weekends, nights, uh, midnights, middle of the nights into getting this uh, campaign 
underway that will launch on May the 19th. Um, we just feel strongly that there's more leverage we have together than apart on some of these issues and bringing attention um, from policymakers and the media uh, through some of the initiatives that are already described in the health care reform bill, although not specific to any of these conditions, uh, that now is the time and that we have uh, a lot to gain by working together to try to bring attention to these conditions and hope that the patient communities that each of us serve will uh, join in on that effort. Um, let's see, I know we have gone way over our time and um, it's amazing there's still 165 people listening in. Um, so you haven't abandoned us yet. Uh, thank you for hanging in there. I know it's not easy to sit and listen, even though uh, you may be reclined or sitting with a laptop on your lap um, somewhere more comfortable, but uh, it's, it's hard to listen to something like this and, and remain focused on it. So we all appreciate uh, the time and energy that folks have taken to be with us this afternoon. And there have been some questions about the May 19th campaign and where to find information about that. Again, we will try to send out sort of a, a comprehensive if not exhaustive list of resources that have come up um, through the course of this webinar. And since we are so late in the afternoon, I think we'll close it off here. But please know that the, uh, all the questions that were submitted will go to each of us um, and we'll have the opportunity um, you know, to follow up with individuals or um, perhaps with a, another webinar on some of these topics later. Uh, on in the year after we've had a chance to get this campaign off the ground um, and just appreciate the time and attention and everything that uh, each one of these organizations does to, to serve a very, um, a very needing and um, underserved population of women, men, and children. And uh, just want to extend my thanks to Mary Lou and Terry and Chris for um, taking part today and preparing their presentations and sharing their time and afternoon and experience with us um, and being part of this webinar series. Thank you. And with that, we will sign off. Um, and thanks again. Look for our email uh, sometime tomorrow afternoon with some URLs for more information and ways to stay involved and stay uh, informed. That uh, is perhaps the most important thing that each and every one of us can do. So uh, have a good rest of your afternoon. And uh, thank you again for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Kim.